We are now going to get four presentations, one after the other, then plenty of time for questions after that. And the presentations, the first half of this, will start, as Andrew said, with Christian Schultz, who has written two very, um, uh, very interesting, uh, and not particularly uh, uplifting chapters about the, uh, about the future of the uh, current state and future of the UK uh, economy. We'll then move on to uh, uh, presentations about public finances, public spending, and tax, which will be given by my colleagues uh, Tom Pope, Ben Zaranko, uh, and Tom Waters. Um, they, they will go through the kind of key uh, macro uh, and public finance issues, and then we'll dive into some more specific issues in the second half of today. So, Christian, do you want to start off, um, and, uh, and then we'll have questions, I say, after the four of those have spoken. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for all the kind words of introduction. Thank you very much for uh, having me. Um, thank you also very much for the very intense collaboration, especially in the last few uh, weeks with the editors, so with Christine, uh, Carl, and uh, Paul. Um, all these very, very late night emails I received, in particular from Christine, and all the <laughs> early morning responses she got from me, because um, obviously working in the markets, I start at uh, seven, so a very, very short nights uh, in between. But um, that, that big piece uh, of, um, of, uh, of wood um, is um, uh, an incredible uh, piece of work, uh, and I'm extremely proud to be uh, part of it. Uh, I am Christian Schultz. I'm City's uh, lead UK uh, economist. Um, so I've been holding this position since Michael Saunders uh, departed. Uh, he was the long-term uh, UK economist at City. He's now on the, on, the, um, on the MPC. But we're keeping up, hopefully, his uh, good work uh, in a good uh, team effort. So there's more people than just me uh, behind this work, um, obviously. Uh, we've contributed two chapters, one, uh, as Andrew mentioned, on the global economy, um, not so much just on the outlook for the global economy, but in particular, its repercussions for the UK. Uh, basically, what we're saying is that there's major challenges like for globalization. Is good, but if you major challenges for globalization uh, out there. I don't know where that voice came from, <laughs> but <laughs> I hope it wasn't the divine intervention here. Um, <laughs> We could and, do with one of those, actually. <laughs> we might need one or two of those. Um, so a global outlook uh, and its repercussions for the UK. And the second chapter from which I actually draw most of my um, presentation today is on the uh, UK uh, economic outlook, uh, where besides an outlook, we uh, delve a bit deeper into the uh, forecasts around the referendum and how they've played out and what we can learn from them for forecasts at the moment, where, again, we've got major you know, uncertainty about diff different scenarios uh, ahead of us. But without further uh, ado, um, into the slides. Um, the first point uh, I'd like to make uh, on the UK is we've seen a great decoupling of the UK economy, both from its historic trends in recent years, but also from uh, the international uh, environment um, over the last two years uh, as well, in particular since the EU referendum. So UK growth since 2016 has been rather uh, modest, both in historical and international comparison. Up until 2016, as you can see in this chart of real GDP growth in year-on-year -year terms, uh, the UK was a growth leader in the world. Um, since then, it has fallen behind major rivals or partners, trade partners, um, especially since the EU referendum. Uh, there are many reasons for these uh, things. Some are almost purely mechanical, like the slowdown in um, private consumption, which we've had as a result of sterling dropping, inflation rising, and then real incomes uh, weakening. But one aspect of this, I think, is particularly worth pointing out, because it does have a lot to do with Brexit uncertainty, and that's the weakness uh, in business investment that we've seen. So this chart actually looks quite similar to the previous one, but it's only business investment in the UK, in Germany, and in the US. Uh, again, in year-on-year -year terms. And you can see how there was a slowdown investment prior to the referendum, which wasn't genuinely UK. It was right around the world. had to, a lot to do with oil prices, emerging markets, uh, China in particular at that time. 
But then there was a big recovery in investment growth in the US and in Germany, for example. But that recovery, recovery in investment growth never materialized in the UK. The UK just kept flatlining. In our view, uh, the UK factor in this is Brexit uncertainty. Um, it really is worth highlighting that the US benefited from um, tax um, reform, tax cuts effectively, whereas uh, Germany um, benefited from a rebound in uh, global investment growth and global investment cycle, in particular uh, a rebound uh, in China. But the UK benefited from neither of these two factors uh, and continued to flatline. In our view, a clear effect of Brexit uncertainty. As a result of these um, this underperformance and this decoupling, uh, both in general growth in terms of investment, uh, the UK economy is this year probably around 2% smaller than forecasters like the Bank of England <coughs> and, and us were expecting before the referendum, predicated on the assumption that people would vote to remain uh, in the EU. But the path towards this you know, landing zone, which is pretty much precisely where we thought it would be, after the referendum is slightly different from what we had expected. So as you can see here, both we and the Bank of England expected a pretty rapid decline in the UK economy right after the referendum, and then a quick stabilization and recovery to growth rates, which we had seen before the referendum. What really happened is initially pretty much nothing. The economy kept growing at exactly the path that everybody had forecast before the referendum, again predicated on uh, a remain uh, vote, but then it started decoupling from that uh, trend. And as you can see here, uh, the dark blue line is about to join the light blue line with the, with the dots, which is the Bank of England's forecast, at around the end of uh, this year. So by now, um, the UK economy is pretty much where the Bank of England at least thought it would be um, at this uh, stage uh, after the referendum. Now, is the current growth rate going to go back now to pre-crisis, um, well, pre-referendum uh, levels, or is it going to stay low, in which case the damage that apparently the referendum did to the economy is going to only grow as uh, things, things progress? Uh, and there are some positive and some negative signs. Uh, a negative one, if you like, is uh, the savings rate. So what we've got here in this chart is the UK household savings rate as a percentage of um, disposable income uh, in comparison with, uh, again, Germany and uh, the UK, uh, sorry, the US. And what you can see is that the UK has had a, a very idiosyncratic, uh, very strong decline, almost collapse in the private sector savings rate. Um, now this, uh, as I mentioned, happened already before uh, the EU referendum to some degree. It may have something to do with pension, uh, freedom pension legislation, but it continued right through the referendum and there was no recovery, um, or at least at, on, on the current um, cr um, crop of data, there has not been any recovery uh, in UK saving, household savings uh, since then. To some degree, this is obviously positive, because what happened is household looked through the uncertainty after um, the referendum, um, as well as the surge in inflation that we had for a while, and continued spending, um, hoping that uh, the economy would just you know, continue um, to grow uh, at the historically average uh, pace, so that households were effectively just smoothing um, uh, private consumption. The problem is, of course, if households are wrong, and the economy is weakening further, and perhaps in case of a no-deal scenario, dramatically uh, further, then there's less um, firepower, less uh, resilience left in household spending than before. So going forward, uh, households have, because of that, if you like, unsaving, um, less scope to support the economy in case there is another uh, downturn. So that is uh, slightly worrying. What is a bit more uplifting is that there are signs that productivity growth might be coming back. Um, so this chart shows GDP growth split into uh, more labor input, so more hours worked, uh, and more output per hour worked. Uh, and as I think many will be aware, um, UK productivity growth has been very weak, but UK jobs growth and hours work growth has been very strong over recent years. So most of growth in the UK uh, and not just the UK, of course, has come from more work rather than more output per unit uh, worked. But that seems to be changing just at the moment where 
labor input growth is uh, slowing, in fact, turned negative in year near terms in the second quarter of this year. Uh, output per unit work, so output per hour, seems to be picking up. In a way, that's surprising uh, because investment is so weak. So normally you would expect productivity growth to pick up when there's strong investment, so capital deepening, as we call that. Uh, the amount of capital per hour worked is higher, and then the output per hour worked is also higher. But there's, of course, another element to um, productivity growth, and that is what we call total factor productivity, effectively the, 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 the production processes that you can make more efficient. So one theory that, um, that I push at the moment is that uh, over the last <coughs> five years, when workers were cheap, and um, very available. Companies hired a lot, but didn't really pay too much attention to um, work processes, hoping that um, as time goes by and work, um, workers' cheap work runs out, they'd you know, make up for that with, uh, with more investment. But now, because of Brexit uncertainty, they're not investing. So what they're focusing on at the moment is trying to improve, trying to get more out of the labor that they already have. Um, so total, productivity, total factor productivity is rising as labor input falls and capital input doesn't really pick up. So that would suggest that uh, productivity growth and thus um, sustainable growth in the UK could, could actually rise or at least not fall as much as people fear. Now, you can't talk about the UK economy without talking about the B word. Um, I do have uh, sometimes investors coming in um, from around the world asking me to talk about the UK economy, but not about Brexit because they've heard so much about it already, um, and then suggest to maybe talk about the Bank of England uh, instead. Um, but if you do that, it takes you about 30 seconds, and then you try and avoid the word um, and say something, something else meaning the same thing. So you can't avoid uh, making assumptions about the, the Brexit process. Our um, assumption is uh, one of a smooth but hard uh, Brexit, so Brexit in our um, economic models is a two-step two process. First, a transition where not much, if anything, changes, which is, of course, in line with um, the UK and the EU, for instance, agreeing uh, the current uh, withdrawal and transition treaty, uh, which is has a draft on the EU's uh, website, but obviously, as we know now, uh, not agreed uh, yet. So a transition where not much changes. And then in the long run, the assumption is that the UK will revert to a WTO-based, for instance, Canada-style Canada uh, free trade agreement, <coughs> where the important thing for me as an economist is not so much the legal base and what exactly happens to various borders, but more that goods trade will remain largely free, but services trade won't. Um, so that's underlying our uh, forecasts. Um, if that is the case, um, what does that mean for our forecast? Now, the first thing, and that's what I mentioned is a big part of this chapter, is to see um, as these uh, events, as these changes in the UK economy are coming up, what can we learn from the 2016 experience uh, about our forecast? Uh, what the chart shows is the deviation of um, uh, actual uh, growth in various components of GDP from the forecast before and after the referendum. So for example, the very left column shows that uh, the Bank of England, um, from which all these forecasts are taken, was expecting GDP between 2015 and 2016, so over the years 2016, 17, and 18, to grow by just under 7% before the referendum, and then cut that forecast to just under 5% after the referendum. The actual growth over this period is highly likely to be, if there's no major deviations in the last couple of quarters from what we and everybody's forecasting, is also likely to be just under 5%. So the forecast error that the Bank of England made after the referendum is very, very small, only 0.2%. But in the various components, as there always is, there are quite large forecast errors. So you can see that private consumption was uh, weaker than expected before the referendum, but much stronger over this period than expected right after the referendum. Business investment, as I mentioned before, by contrast, was pretty much bang in line with what people and what the Bank of England had expected right after the referendum. So it was flat over this um, period. Residential investment was much stronger. Exports were much stronger than expected, but imports were also much stronger, and the two then kind of offset each other so that the net external impact was actually, again, roughly in line with expectations. So this is what happened. What can we learn from this? 
business investment is clearly the thing to focus on when you make Brexit related forecasts. Uh, consumers just kept spending, so don't bet too much against the UK consumer. Import substitution, which people expected, takes a lot more time than we all think. Our habits and our supply chains are just much more difficult to adjust than we uh, may think. The rest of the world um, so far hasn't been affected by Brexit at all. In fact, if you compare, make the same comparison as I made for the UK, you might even come to the conclusion that the rest of the world benefited uh, greatly from Brexit. But that just shows how these forecast comparisons, the weaknesses of these forecast comparisons. Uh, finally, uh, construction investment has, uh, you know, very much depends on policy. So, uh, you know, forecasting that is very difficult. Uh, the housing market was a Brexit victim and maybe in the future, as Mark Carney has pointed out. Uh, policymakers are very important. The Bank of England, of course, waded in after Brexit with, uh, fiscal, with monetary policy loosening. And in my view, at least, there was also a lot of fiscal loosening going on. Uh, Sterling's pass through to inflation was faster than expected. Uh, and that's the final point on this. When you forecast in particular no deal, you have to keep in mind that while 2016 we were forecasting no changes but great uncertainty, no deal would mean great uncertainty, but major changes, uh, which may also affect your forecasts. Final uh, point for me um, on the uh, first chapter is on uh, global trends. Uh, you'll see that uh, in, in the chapter that we at City are relatively optimistic on uh, global growth in general, but that we see big divergences, big gaps opening up between the performance of some countries on the positive side, for instance, the US, on the negative side, many of the emerging markets, uh, also gaps in the valuations of financial markets of various risks that we identify. But in general, it's still a, a fairly positive um, picture. But what we're highlighting is here that the UK has been extremely successful in globalization over the last 25 years. It's been successful in specializing on advanced economy service provision. It's benefited greatly from immigration in our view. Uh, and it's been traditionally um, a big recipient of international investment, but also a great investor in the rest of the world. So very much involved in global financial uh, flows. And all of these factors, all of these success factors are at risk, and that's irrespective of Brexit, or at least <coughs> challenged, irrespective of Brexit. So I think it is worth pointing out that in manufacturing, for instance, the UK uh, has so far been more or less an also ran. What you see here is trade intensities, the, the upper line here on the left, in the left, uh, top left chart would be the most successful economies in terms of um, trade intensity in goods trades or manufacturing. Uh, the bottom line would be um, the least successful ones. Uh, the UK is somewhere in the middle and has been all the time. There's no particular trend to, to be seen. Of course, the UK is very successful in some manufacturing industries, small pockets of its highly specialized, highly tech, tech. But in general, the UK is more or less an also ran in manufacturing so far. Where it is absolutely the global leader, at least among advanced economies, is in services where the UK has, been, has seen growing trade intensity uh, and uh, clearly leading the world uh, all the time. Um, so this is where the UK's success so far lies. The UK has troubles with its external uh, imbalances. The, U the uh, IMF calculates that the UK's um, current account deficit of almost 5% of GDP um, is um, has the biggest adjustment need in the Western uh, world and actually beyond as well. Um, that in a time of Brexit is already challenging, but also when you look at global financial regulation, which um, really has over the last 10 years focused on international um, exposures, trying to reduce those as lots of risks are associated, that in itself would be a challenge to a global financial center like the UK um, already. Uh, and then finally, um, migration, um, we point out that migration is a big political topic. There's been a big backlash right around the world, including in the UK, to uh, free uh, migration. But more importantly, perhaps in the short term, um, migration, especially in Europe, uh, irrespective of Brexit, irrespective of all these backlashes, is, seems to be falling anyway, not just in the UK, but also in Germany, because of convergence, because of the recovery that we're seeing in many of the countries where lots of the immigrants recently have come from. So uh, learning to um, use one's domestic resources and not relying too much on immigration, irrespective of the Brexit consequences, is going to be a big challenge. Finally, uh, the numbers. We expect uh, UK GDP this year to grow by 1.3%. 
Uh, we expect slightly higher growth next year. That's because beginning of e the year next year, as we head for the Brexit deadlines, is probably still going to be weak. But then we do <coughs> expect uh, a kind of a relief rally in the rest of the year. And if our assumption is right that we get a transition where not much will change, that relief rally may well last uh, for a few years, as you see in our charts. In terms of comparing to other forecasters, for this year and next year, we're roughly in line with consensus, perhaps slightly lower. Uh, after that, we're clearly uh, above, um, which concludes this presentation with a slightly optimistic uh, message, at least if you believe me. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and with this, I, uh, of course, then hand over to the, the next presenters.